So on the esophagus, on J17, so we wrote that it's a 10-inch long muscular tube that extends from the laryngopharynx, C6, down to the stomach, T10. Okay, a couple of comments here. Comment number one, I've indicated how long the esophagus is. I will not test you on how long the esophagus is. I do not test any, uh, any time how long a tube is. I only mention it so you get a sense, you know, of whether it's a short tube or it's a long tube, but I'm not going to ask you how many inches long it is. Uh, I indicated that it carries the food from the laryngopharynx to the stomach. Now that you have to know. It connects from the lower part of your throat, the laryngopharynx, and it carries the food down to the stomach. That you have to know. I also indicated, though, so where is the laryngopharynx and where is the stomach? And we indicated that the laryngopharynx is located at the level of C6. Now, I am not going to test you on that. I'm not. But I only mention that because we have told you previously that we almost use the vertebral column as a yardstick to figure out where things are. We, for example, know how to find the heart real quickly, the top of your heart from the back side, real quickly. How do you do that? You, f you feel, palpate or feel that spinous process on the back of your neck. And that's C7, the seventh cervical vertebrae, the, the bottom cervical. And the top of the heart is T2. So you count two more spines below that, and that's the top of the heart. That one you do need to know, because we've said that's an important clinical landmark. So we do use that vertebral column or spine almost like a yardstick. We don't have x-ray vision. And when you're doing a physical examination of a patient, you have to have a sense of where these structures are. So we, know, we can use this vertebral column as a way of locating these things. So I just mentioned it C6 is the laryngo effects. I'm not going to test you on it, but that's easy to find. C7 is that spine. So one spine above it is where your laryngopharynx is. The esophagus begins there, and it extends down to T10. So if you feel C7, the next spine is T1. You count 10 spines down, and that's the, where the esophagus connects to the stomach. So again, I'm not asking, I'm not going to test you on it, but this is how, what you will learn when you take, uh, learn in your clinical program as a nurse, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, about physical examination of a patient. All right, now I mentioned that the bolus of food moves down the esophagus by a peristaltic wave of contraction. Now we would have thought, look, if you're just sitting or standing, a gravity is just going to pull the food down to your stomach. But in fact, our body doesn't rely upon gravity. Because in fact, you can put food in your mouth. You can even put water in your mouth and stand upside down on your head and still swallow, and it will still go to your stomach. So if, you're if food is going from your throat to your stomach and you're upside down, it's not gravity making that happen. So it is literally this peristaltic contraction that's pushing that food or drink to your stomach. So it, that's what it relies on, is peristaltic contractions. That takes us to J18. Uh, now on J18, the upper half of J18, I hope to cover yet today. But I'm going to skip over it for the moment. That's the microscopic structure of the alimentary canal. We'll come back to that. But I want to look at the middle of J18. And we mentioned, we start to talk about the stomach. I mentioned that the stomach is kind of a J-shaped muscular organ located in the left upper quadrant of the abdominal cavity. So I want to tell you a little bit about what organs are located in our abdominal cavity. All right, so uh, the, uh, we divide the abdominal cavity into four quadrants. Kind of reminds us of how we divide the mouth into four quadrants. So there's a right upper quadrant, a right lower quadrant, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant. Now, it, it, this is if you're pointing to your own body, all right, so you can see where your own right upper quadrant is, or your own left upper quadrant. Of course, when you're looking at a patient, 
the right and left we use is their right and left, not your right or left. I'm holding up my right hand. It may be on your left side, but this is my right hand. So we always have to, if we're describing the right upper quadrant of your patient, it's your patient's right upper quadrant, not yours. Anyhow, uh, here it identifies some of the more important organs that are in uh, these uh, quadrants. We're going to look at this picture, then I'm going to show you a better picture. Uh, the most notable structures that are in the right upper quadrant are the huge liver, and it's not shown here, but also the gallbladder. We're going to show you a better picture where you can see it. If somebody is complaining of pain in the right up, their right upper quadrant, then as somebody who's learned anatomy, you immediately start to think maybe they've got injury or disease or a disorder of their liver or gallbladder. That's what we're thinking. And the major structures in the left upper quadrant are the stomach, and it's not shown here, but right underneath the stomach is the pancreas. So if somebody is complaining of pain in the left upper quadrant, we know what's there, and we're thinking problems with their stomach or pancreas. Now, in the right lower quadrant, in the right lower quadrant, and in the left lower quadrant, there are a bunch of intestines. But in the right lower quadrant, there is a really notable structure. It's called the appendix. Anybody who knows anything, if somebody is complaining of bad pain in their right lower quadrant, the first thing that anybody who knows anything thinks in their mind is appendicitis. All right? So this is, you know, when most people, when they've got pain from their belly, they don't know what these organs are. They don't even know what organ is located where in their body. They don't even know what these organs are called. But you do, because you're going into the healthcare field and they're not. So let's look at a better picture. Let's look at the page just before J1. The page just before J1. So on the page just before J1, it looks like this. <coughs> And this shows the entire digestive system pretty nicely. And so here we can see uh, the abdomen, and we could imagine dividing it into uh, four quadrants. And let's just look at this picture, because this shows things a little bit more clearly and in more detail. So here we can see, and incidentally, do you think they have pictures in color in your lab manual or not? Yes, of course. All right? So, uh, and, and I've got all kinds of links to stuff. So here in the right upper quadrant, here is the liver. It's not labeled, but that's the biggest organ in the body, if you don't count the skin. And right underneath the liver, and we're going to learn much more about this, is this little green shaped, uh, green colored sac called the gallbladder. Kind of looks like a little avocado. That's labeled. And then there are all these tubes or ducts. These are the bile ducts. Last class meeting, we learned that there are a number of accessory exocrine glands that are associated with the digestive system. And what was, how did we define an uh, exocrine gland? Did we explain what that is or not? It's a gland that secretes a chemical substance into a duct, into a tube. We learned that on page, and you wrote it on J1. So again, I strongly urge you, don't get behind. There's a lot, a lot of information. All right, so uh, the, these are in the right upper quadrant. Here in the right lower quadrant, the appendix right there. In the uh, uh, left upper qu uh, quadrant, left upper quadrant, we see the stomach, and right below it, the pancreas. So this picture reveals that. So uh, that, this shows it uh, very nicely as far as, uh, in more detail, what structures are where. So that takes us to J21. And on J21, so now we're going to look at the anatomy, the internal anatomy of the stomach. So the stomach, we've learned, is in the right upper quadrant. If you use your imagination, it kind of looks like a letter J. That's what they say. And here we can see where the esophagus connects to the stomach. 
Now, the uh, inside of the stomach is, it has these ridges or folds. It has these internal ridges or folds that are called rugae. There it is, rugae. And if that word rugae sounds like you've heard it before, last time we learned that there are ridges on the roof of your mouth. They were called palatine rugae. This is J21. And uh, so I, I, the way the, my, what I use to remember that is I think of you know that brand of potato chips, ruffles have ridges. All right, so rugae are ridges. So the rugae, which starts with the letter R, are these ridges or folds. Now, right where the esophagus attaches to the stomach, there is a muscular valve or sphincter. There's actually a, a muscular valve or sphincter right here. Uh, and it is called the gastroesophageal sphincter. The older name for it was the cardiac sphincter. A sphincter or valve, we use those terms in interchangeably, so we call it a sphincter or a valve, is a circular shaped muscle. It is a ring shaped muscle. I'll tell you more about sphincters or valves in just a moment. There is another sphincter or valve right at the end of the stomach where the stomach attaches to the duodenum of the small intestine. So the first segment of the small intestine is called the duodenum. And this sphincter that's located right here, there's a ring-shaped or circular-shaped sphincter right here, is called the pyloric sphincter or pyloric valve. Now, what is the purpose of this ring-shaped muscular valve or sphincter. And I wrote right here, the purpose of any sphincter or valve is always the same, to allow one-way flow. And we have valves or sphincters all over our body. There are a whole bunch of valves or sphincters in our, along our alimentary canal, our digestive tract. Uh, there are valves in our heart. There are valves in the veins of our blood vessels. So there are all kinds of valves, and the purpose of them is always to ensure one-way flow. In the case of the pyloric valve or pyloric sphincter, as I drew the arrow, it allows what's in the stomach to go into the duodenum, but prevents what's in the duodenum from going backwards. It ensures one-way flow. Now, the pyloric sphincter works very effectively. It allows only one-way flow. Interestingly, though, the gastroesophageal or, or cardiac sphincter is weak. And so, in fact, not only can things go from the esophagus down in the stomach, but unfortunately, as we'll see, what's in the stomach can also go back up into the esophagus. When that happens, that's called acid reflux or gastroesophageal reflux. We'll get into that. But uh, th that most of the time, these valves do work really well. This one doesn't. I'm going to speculate as to why that is a little bit later. Now, uh, on this side of the stomach, this side right here, it is known as the greater curvature of the stomach. It's labeled. And on this side, it's labeled the lesser curvature. Now, what is attached to both the greater curvature and the lesser curvature are membranes. And these are shown in the lower picture, right here, in the bottom picture. So you'll notice that attached to the greater curvature of the stomach is a fatty membrane that hangs from it. This fatty membrane is called the greater omentum. And it's a fatty membrane that covers over the top surface of the intestines. When we look at the cats next week, you will see this fatty membrane hanging from the stomach and you actually have to lift it up to see the intestines underneath it. It can be lifted up. It's like an apron that you can lift up. Now, what's the purpose of this greater omentum? Why is it there? So we wrote that it has a few functions. Function number one, it cushions. It protects uh, the underlying viscera, the internal organs. Just imagine that uh, if you happen to trip and fall right onto your belly, instead of the weight of your body crushing your intestines, there's a bit of this fat, this fatty membrane 
overline your intestines to cushion them a little bit from any injury or trauma. If you get punched in the belly, at least there's some fat that cushions that blow a little bit. Uh, another role is that it also protects the spread of infection, of bacterial and viral infections to the underlying intestines. Uh, so again, it has this protective role. And it stores fat, which in part explains the tendency for belly fat. Because that's simply a natural place where there's a lot of fat cells that will accumulate fat in these fat cells associated with this membrane called the greater omentum. Now, you'll notice in this picture that it also shows there's a membrane going from the lesser curvature up to the liver. This is called the lesser omentum. And it's not as fatty, it's not as big or as fatty as the greater omentum is. But again, it's protective in nature. You can see this, uh, these uh, uh, omenta even better on the picture on the previous page. So on J20, here you can see, and these are part of these very famous Frank Netter drawings, uh, these medical illustrations. So here's this greater omentum hanging from the greater curvature. Here's the lesser omentum attaching to the underside of the liver, uh, extending from the lesser curvature. If you say, you know, Professor Fink, I'd like to see this in color, you can see it on color. It's on one of the videos I've made. So just go and check all the various resources and links that I've provided you, and you'll see a lot of these images in color. Uh, now, back on J21, now, we divide the stomach into three uh, areas. Uh, the middle part of the stomach right here, the middle part, is called the body. This is the body right here. And the way that I kind of demarcated it is I show the body going from here to here. All right, so this is the body area of the stomach, the main body. This last segment of the stomach is called the pylorus. That's the pylorus part of the stomach. And now that you know that, that explains why this sphincter was called the pyloric sphincter. The, uh, the top part of the stomach is called the fundus of the stomach. And that's this very top area right up here at the very top. It's really referring to that part of the stomach that uh, literally extends higher than where the esophagus connects. You see that? So here's where the esophagus connects, and this part of the stomach is actually higher up than where the stomach connects. So it doesn't connect to the very top. Here, it actually attaches a little bit right about here. So this very top part is called the fundus of the uh, stomach. All of these terms that we've just described uh, were written right here uh, below. Now, on the next page, J22, so we mentioned the gastric rugae. Those are the folds on the uh, inner lining of the stomach. Now, what is our stomach for? Uh, the stomach is basically a muscular sac that stores or holds food. That's its main function. It does very little digestion or very little absorption in the stomach. Last time we learned, we defined digestion and absorption. We re you wrote all about it on J1. And there's very little digestion or absorption of nutrients that occurs in the stomach. Its main job is, and you know, Thanksgiving's coming up. So, you know, classically in a traditional Thanksgiving uh, meal, this is where you eat for about two or three hours without stopping and just see how much food you can take in, you know, over a vast period of time. And the point is, is that you put the food into your mouth faster than you could possibly digest it. So you've got to have a, a sack to hold this food that you keep putting in, keep shoveling it in more and more and more, because, uh, and then what's going to happen is that it fills up with food and then a little bit of food will be released from the stomach into the duodenum a little bit at a time. And we know duodenum is where the digestion occurs. So this digestive process is going to go on for many hours, but uh, we need a way to hold all this food 
you know, very quickly. So that's the main purpose of the stomach. Now, it is a muscular sac, so it does tend to churn and, and, and grind up and mix up that food. And uh, we also mentioned that there are gastric glands in the wall of the stomach. So in the wall of the stomach, there are these gastric glands that secrete gastric juice into the uh, stomach to mix with the food. And this mixture, this mixture of food, ground up food, churned up food, mixed with this juice, this gastric juice, is called chyme. Chyme is the name we give for this uh, 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 food that's churned up, mixed up, and uh, mixed with this gastric juice. And if you're thinking, I don't understand chyme, well, you'll understand it if I explain it this way. When you expel that chyme out of your mouth, we call it vomit. When it's still in your stomach, we call it chyme. It's the same stuff. So what's chyme? Vomit. Right? If you vomit, it's just a bunch of churned up food mixed up with gastric juice. Now, uh, the gastric juice uh, contains two major chemicals in the gastric juice. HCl, hydrochloric acid, and a second chemical called pepsinogen. Now, the cells that, of the gastric glands that secrete the hydrochloric acid are called parietal cells. I put that in brackets. I'm not going to test you on that. I'm not. But uh, the, uh, the uh, cells that secrete this uh, hydrochloric acid are called parietal cells. The cells that secrete pepsinogen are known as chief cells. Again, I'm not going to test you on the names of the cells. Now, what does hydrochloric acid do? It has two major functions, and neither one is what you think. If you ask most typical people about hydrochloric acid in the stomach, they say, oh, yeah, I think it, it that's just like digest all your food. It actually doesn't digest food. <coughs> The major function of hydrochloric acid is to kill most of the bacteria in our food. And it works really well in doing that. Some of us have heard of the uh, five second rule. You ever heard of that? You say, what's the five second rule? What's the five second rule? When, it hits, when the food hits the ground. Yeah, you're holding a slice of pizza, it slips out of your hands, drops onto the ground. Yeah, you got five seconds to pick it up, clean up, throw off the dust there, and it's fine. Well, we're just kidding. It's loaded with bacteria, all right? Would I still eat it? Of course I would still eat it. Because it doesn't matter if it's five seconds, it could have been 20 seconds. It could have been a half hour. The point is, it's not the time. It's already got dirt and, and bacteria and stuff on it the moment it hit the ground. So in fact, even before it hit the ground, it's got bacteria. There's bacteria in the air that landed on the pizza. So this hydrochloric acid really does work quite effectively in killing the vast majority of bacteria. It doesn't kill them all. There are some really tough bacteria that are not killed by the hydrochloric acid, but it does kill most of them. Now, the other chemical, yep? I have a question. How come when you pour hydrochloric acid on your skin, it burns, but it doesn't burn through your skin? Okay, a wonderful question. Because we learned back on page D, uh, D5, the kind of tissue that forms the inner lining of the stomach. Simple columnar epithelium with mucus secreting goblet cells. And those goblet cells basically secrete a whole bunch of gooey mucus right here. So that acts as a shielding against this hydrochloric acid and all this gastric juice. Now even then, the acid takes its toll, and we have to constantly make new cells on the inside lining of our alimentary canal. Did we ever learn that? Emphatically, yes. Remember, when we were learning about cell division, we told you which parts of our body are constantly making new cells. That included the skin on the outer surface, where we constantly make new cells, and the inside lining of our alimentary canal, because that acid does kill these cells. But between the fact that it's covered by mucus, uh, and our outer skin isn't, and uh, uh, it is one of the ways that it shields and protects, acts as a protective coating uh, to help uh, prevent them from just getting destroyed. Without that protective mucus covering, it would be like pouring the acid right on the surface of your skin. 
Okay, so, uh, and incidentally, should, if you're thinking, what, do we have to know the tissue that forms the inside lining of the stomach? Yes, we learned that on page D5. It's tissue uh, number four, four on the top of page D5. So, um, the second chemical that is released by the cells of the gastric glands is pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is, an, uh, is uh, an inactive form of a digestive enzyme. And uh, the active form is called pepsin. Now, uh, pep we've learned that most enzymes are named so that the ending ends in ACE, ASE. And we have uh, uh, pointed out, like uh, uh, we've spoken of last class meeting, salivary amylase. So most enzymes have an ACE ending. This is an exception. It doesn't end in ACE, but it is nevertheless an enzyme. Uh, it has to be activated, though. And the second role of hydrochloric acid, and that's why I wrote a number two here. Here's a number one. It kills bacteria. What's the second role of hydrochloric acid? It activates this pepsinogen into the active form called pepsin. And it, it's very common in the world of bi biochemistry and physiological chemistry that when we have a chemical that has to be activated, the inactive form has the ending G-E-N, gen, and the active form, we drop that G-E-N ending. So it goes from pepsinogen to pepsin. A couple of other examples, what an example that we will learn later in this course, not too long from now, uh, is we, when we talk about blood clotting, so in the uh, blood clotting is a complex series of react chemical, biochemical reactions culminating in the formation of a fibrin clot. But fibrin is actually formed from an inactive form called fibrinogen. And fibrinogen is activated into the fibrin clot by another chemical called th uh, thrombin. So thrombin converts uh, fibrinogen into fibrin. We will be learning that. But uh, so again, a fibrinogen becomes fibrin, pepsinogen becomes pepsin. That's the active form. Now, what is pepsin? It is a digestive enzyme that begins the process of breaking apart proteins into short peptide chains. Last class meeting, we learned what digestion is all about. Digestion is taking those ma four major categories of organic compounds that are in the foods that we eat, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, and digesting them into simple nutrients. That's called digestion. And really, the only digestion that is occurring in the stomach is some of the proteins. And what is a protein? A protein is a long polypeptide chain. What's poly mean? Many. And peptide means amino acid. So a protein is really a, a chain of 100 or more amino acids. That's what a protein is. But it's got to be broken apart into individual amino acids. And pepsin, and it gets that name pepsin because it's an enzyme that breaks apart a polypeptide, something made up of a lot of amino acids. So pepsin breaks apart a polypeptide. Uh, uh, into short peptide chains uh, where they're each made up of three or four or five amino acids each. Now, can we absorb these short peptide chains? Can we absorb those into our body? No. We can, o we can only absorb them if they're broken further apart into individual amino acids. So we've seen that there's very little digestion that occurs within the stomach. Uh, what we address next is what absorption occurs in the stomach. And as we're going to see, there's very little absorption of nutrients that occurs <clears throat> across the stomach as well. Uh, there are four major things that can be absorbed across the wall of the stomach into the bloodstream. Uh, water. Uh, water can be readily absorbed uh, into the uh, bloodstream from the stomach. Uh, simple sugars or monosaccharides. And an example of something you might ingest, you might eat, that would contain already monosaccharides or simple sugars would be honey. So you may have heard that sometimes honey is referred to as energy food uh, because it has a lot of simple sugars like fructose that are immediately able to be, uh, do not require further digestion uh, and they're ready to be absorbed right away. Uh, another uh, substance, one of my favorites, that is readily absorbed across the stomach is alcohol. 
And in fact, that in part uh, creates that warm feeling that one feels uh, when somebody has a, an alcoholic drink. You kind of feel this warmth. Uh, that's literally the alcohol being absorbed across the wall of the stomach uh, into the bloodstream. And the fourth thing that can be absorbed across the wall of the stomach is aspirin. Uh, now, in the process of aspirin being absorbed across the wall of the stomach, it irritates the wall of the stomach. And that's why, uh, really, today, uh, the use of aspirin has been largely replaced by Tylenol with acetaminophen, uh, <clears throat> which uh, just is not absorbed across the wall of the stomach. It's absorbed across the intestine, uh, and therefore doesn't cause any irritation to the wall of the stomach like aspirin can. So that's really the limit as far as what's uh, absorbed across the wall of the stomach. Now, uh, we wrote as far as how long does it take for the stomach to empty out? And uh, the answer to that is one to four hours. Uh, and what determines that is what did you eat? Did you just finish eating uh, some yogurt and maybe a salad? Or did you just finish eating a Thanksgiving dinner? Uh, obviously, that's going to take longer for the contents of the stomach to empty out into the small intestine. Now, what we've listed next, uh, which we, I try to do for most uh, organs and organ systems in the body, is to describe some of the disorders associated with the stomach. So uh, gastric irritation, there are many things that can irritate the stomach. We've just mentioned aspirin can cause gastric irritation. What is esophagitis, which is inflammation of the esophagus, also known as heartburn, also known as gastric reflux, or the... Ex the term that's usually used today is GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. On the, uh, on the previous page, J21, uh, we had already learned that the uh, gastroesophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter does not really close very effectively, so that uh, not only does uh, food move from the esophagus into the stomach, but it can reflux back up into the uh, esophagus. And when that happens, that's called gastroesophageal reflux uh, disease or disorder. And uh, basically, the problem here is that the acidic chyme uh, in the stomach, when it starts to be regurgitated back up into the lower part of the esophagus, it burns. It creates a burning sensation, and it starts to erode and damage the inside lining of the esophagus. I mean, after all, anybody who's uh, vomited, when you vomit, that's the acidic chyme coming up uh, your throat and out your mouth, and it creates a burning sensation in your throat and mouth. Uh, just imagine that just uh, not uh, the chyme not coming out your mouth, but just uh, refluxing uh, upwards into the lower part of the esophagus. And uh, of course, why it got nicknamed heartburn is because the esophagus anatomically is located right behind the heart, just posterior behind the heart, uh, creating this kind of burning sensation. And so uh, it got known by this expression of heartburn, and that explains also why the sphincter uh, also used to be referred to as the cardiac sphincter. So if you would like to experience uh, acid reflux, and you don't want to wait until you're more likely to experience this as you're older, uh, here's what you do. Helpful handy hint. Uh, order a pizza with everything on it at about 12 midnight. Maybe drink a couple of beers uh, in addition. And then immediately go to sleep on a full stomach. We can imagine that if the uh, stomach is filled uh, with the contents, uh, it's very easy to imagine it refluxing right back up into the esophagus because this gastroesophageal sphincter isn't very effective. And so it'll create this burning sensation in the lower part of the esophagus known as acid reflex or heartburn. What is a gastric ulcer? We know that an ulcer is a sore. We learned that back at section F when we learned the term decubitus ulcers uh, or, uh, or bed sores. Uh, ulcers can be in any place in the body. If they're in the stomach, they're called gastric ulcers. Now, for many, many, many years, uh, they thought that these uh, sores in the stomach were due to stress. Not that long ago, an Australian microbiologist uh, using the postulates of Koch uh, demonstrated that the majority of these gastric ulcers or sores are actually due to a bacterial infection 
uh, in the stomach. And the name of the bacteria, which I'm not asking you to know, is called Helicobacter pylori. Uh, you'll probably hear about it when you take microbiology, but I'm not testing you on it. Why it's called pylori is because it proliferates or grows primarily in the pylorus region, the lower part of the uh, stomach is where these uh, sores form due to the proliferation or growth of this bacteria. Incidentally, this bacteria can also grow in the uh, first segment of the small intestine called the duodenum, and then that would cause duodenal ulcers as opposed to gastric ulcers. Today, uh, now that we know that it's caused by a bacterial infection, uh, they will uh, prescribe uh, a regimen of tetracycline antibiotic uh, and uh, have the person also take some Pepto-Bismo. And usually over 80% of the people with gastric ulcers are healed and basically cured of the ulcers within 7 to 10 days. Uh, gastritis is a generic term for itis or inflammation of the stomach. Let's talk about the very important subject of flatulence. Flatulence means gas. And uh, <clears throat> of course there's gas uh, that can be uh, belched out your mouth and gas that can be belched, as it were, out the other end, out the anus. And uh, <clears throat> the major source of gas in the stomach that is belched out the mouth uh, is uh, the ingestion of carbonated drinks. Carbonated drinks are drinks with little bubbles of carbon dioxide in them. And that includes uh, regular Coke and Diet Coke, and in fact, most dr common soda drinks are carbonated. It also includes beer. Beer is carbonated, uh, and it includes champagne, uh, sparkling wines, Asti Spamanti. So uh, when you swallow these, especially quickly, the, the, uh, these little bubbles of carbon dioxide are released, and the person has a desire to burp, burp or belch uh, the carbon dioxide out their mouth. Uh, another source of flatulence is some people, when they eat, swallow air as they eat, and uh, they will burp or belch out the air from their uh, stomach. And 10-year-old uh, boys especially like to purposely swallow air into their stomach and do creative uh, noises uh, creative burping and belching sounds. Now, <clears throat> the gas that is generated uh, below the pyloric sphincter, you might say what? Uh, the gas that's uh, formed in the stomach comes out the, uh, comes out the mouth. But any gas that is generated that forms uh, in the intestines below the pyloric sphincter, because the pyloric sphincter prevents uh, backwards flow, any gas in the small intestine or large intestine has to come out the end of the alimentary canal, out the anus, rather than out the mouth uh, because of that pyloric sphincter. Uh, as we will learn later when we get to the large intestine, uh, the major source of gas that comes out the anal end uh, is due to gases produced by bacteria uh, breaking down food residues in the large intestine. And these gases that are generated uh, are then uh, passed out the uh, uh, anus. This is a very exciting subject, uh, but uh, I'm sure everybody wanted to know about gas and flatulence. <clears throat> and uh, on page uh, J23, on uh, J23, so uh, we have cancer of the stomach. We've learned that, unfortunately, uh, cancer can occur anywhere in the body. This is where normal cells undergo mutation or change, and they become cancerous cells. And uh, that, again, that can occur anywhere in the body. Whenever cancer is in any tissue or organ of the body, currently they surgically remove the cancerous structure. So if somebody has cancer in the walls of their stomach, they're going to remove the stomach. So if they remove the stomach, that means they don't have a stomach anymore. And so uh, imagine, therefore, they have to connect the esophagus to the duodenum, and there is no stomach. Now, if you don't have a stomach, what did we say the major function of a stomach was? To hold food. So now you have no sac to hold food. So the person is very limited. They can only eat tiny bits of food at a time. 
because they don't have a sac to hold it. So that's the main uh, problem with uh, stomach cancer after they remove the stomach. Incidentally, something similar happens. Uh, of course, they have these surgical procedures now for people who are obese who want to lose weight, where they basically either resect or remove part of the stomach, they st or can staple the stomach, make it smaller, or they can even put a lap band, right, a ring around the stomach to constrict it, to narrow it, and that prevents the person from eating so much food all at once. So uh, this is not because they had uh, cancer of the stomach, but it's simply to prevent the person from eating very much food all at once. Back on J23, pyloric stenosis. Now that word stenosis is a very important word. It's, we're going to run into this word over and over again. It means a narrowing, a constriction, narrowing or a constriction. In this case, pyloric stenosis is when there is a narrowing or constriction in the pylorus area of the stomach. So in this picture, this is the last part of the stomach, the pylorus area. Here's the duodenum. Can everybody see that the passageway has gotten really narrowed or constricted? This is called pyloric stenosis. The lumen or passageway is narrowed. Now, why has this happened? I wrote, it's congenital. That means a baby is born this way. And it's pretty common. This is not a rare condition. About, it is more <laughs> common in boy babies than girl babies. I'm not <laughs> testing you on the frequency, but you should know it is more common in boys than girls. Uh, one out of every 200 boy babies is born with uh, uh, pyloric stenosis and about one out of every thousand girl babies. Uh, now, how, do you, how does a parent know that their child has this, this infant has this condition? It's actually really simple. So every time the uh, infant takes milk, whether it's being bottle fed or breast fed, so uh, the milk uh, goes into the uh, stomach, but it cannot go into the duodenum. It's just too narrow. So the milk's having trouble going into the duodenum. So the baby keeps basically burping up all the milk. Now it's very common after you have a little a baby feeds to burp up a little bit of milk, but it basically burps up everything that it just drank. So not only does the mother notice that the baby seems to be burping up all the milk, where you put pressure on the tummy, it all just comes out because it's not going into the intestine, but they also, the mother notices the baby's losing weight. The baby is basically not absorbing any nourishment and it's becoming very uh, inactive, and it's losing weight. It's getting uh, skinnier and skinnier. So it doesn't take long before uh, the mother calls the pediatrician and says, I'm really concerned. My baby just keeps burping up most of the milk. It's losing weight. Any pediatrician, any doctor who knows anything, immediately thinks pyloric stenosis, because it's so common. Now, what do they do? It's a surgical procedure. Uh, at where they will widen or dilate that uh, portion of the uh, uh, stomach that's narrowed or constricted, stenotic. The surgery is apparently, I'm not a surgeon, but it's apparently very straightforward, but it is very, very traumatic for parents to take their two-week-old or three-week-old infant for basically abdominal surgery. So uh, that's very traumatic. But usually there's no complications and it's all straightforward. But it is pretty common. It's not unco uncommon. Um, okay, and then the uh, last item here of uh, vomiting. So we remind you that vomiting is a Valsalva maneuver, something that we learned about in Section H uh, for uh, the previous exam. A Valsalva maneuver is when you tighten your abdominal muscles to increase intra-abdominal pressure to expel something. Whether it's to cough or sneeze or to defecate or to expel the baby during birth uh, labor uh, or in this case to expel the contents of the stomach up and out the mouth. So uh, that's vomiting or heaves is a Valsalva maneuver. We could even speculate that perhaps the reason why the gastroesophageal or cardiac sphincter is not that effective is because if it were, it would prevent the ability to vomit out the contents of the stomach. 
Uh, so it is only by virtue of the fact that that gastroesophageal sphincter does not close very effectively that permits vomiting to occur. 